Every, every Sunday we come here as the church. Uh, everything that we do, we exist as a church for the church. So sometimes we need, we need to remind ourselves of who we are, our identity, what's our purpose, what are we here for, what, why does the Lighthouse exist, what's the role of the pastors, what's your role, and things like that. So, so that's why this passage is so, so important for us. And in Paul's letters, there's always a, s such a beautiful balance of doctrine, and life, life application. And we can see that in the book of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians is always a very good example. Verse number one, chapter four. We look at chapter four today. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. So that's a very strong introduction. I, as Paul is, I identify himself as an authority, as, as the one to, to guide us, as the one speaking on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a prisoner of Christ. Like, he is not talking of his own, uh, whatever he likes to talk about, uh, rain and, you know, whatever, what he's going to do this afternoon, buying or whatever, social activities. He's talking in the name of the Lord, with, by the authority of the Lord. And uh, look at the, the words, and I, I want you to, to remember this expression here. I beseech you, because we will come back to that a little bit longer. It's a very strong uh, terminology to, to, to begin uh, this morning. I beseech you. I urge you, I admonish you to, to walk in a manner worthy. So why do we use the, the terminology walk instead of life because, uh, or live? Uh, live in a way or walk in a way. Because walk, I believe, is a, is a verb of, uh, of actions. To live it's, can be more passive. You can be on an hospital bed and still live. So that's not very active. But if you walk, you're going somewhere. You're doing something. So I think this is a, a verb that Paul is using for a reason. Hallelujah. So the main idea of the first 16 verse of uh, Ephesians chapter 4 is the unity of believers and the growth and the maturity of the body of Christ. You know, Jesus in previous chapters of Ephesians uh, make it very clear that because of his death on the cross, he brought together Jews and Gentiles, which is never seen before. It's never accomplished before. The Jewish people are separated themselves from the Gentiles. They will have nothing to do. But Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, succeeded to do what has never been done before, what was not possible because of racism, because of prejudice, because of different world view of things like that. But through the cross of Christ, there is this spiritual unity together. We will talk about that this morning. So the unity of believers in Christ already exists. And this is why we are here today. If you just look at these small groups, you do many others are on the, on the third floor at the moment. You will see many races, colors, languages here spoken. Like it's a rich variety of people. And what, why are we here? Well, what, what are we doing here? Every Sunday we come here. We shake hands, we hug, and there are people that we go out with afterwards. We, we, we feel that we belong here. Why? It's not because of our human side. It's not because of our language. It's not because of our race or background, cultural background. These are, would all be things that would uh, separate us. But we have something that goes way beyond that, way more important. And that's what brings us here all, all the time. It's what we have in common. We have something in common. Let's go to the next slide, slide four. Ephesians chapter four. Now we will be talking about qualities, the qualities of a wor worthy walk. It's like Paul says, I beseech you to walk, okay, in a manner worthy. So before you read verse 2, put on top of it, I beseech you to walk. And you see, it makes, it makes sense. It's a complete grammatical uh, sentence. I beseech you to walk with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Let's stop there for, for now. And look at these qualities that are essential, 
the qualities that will help us to maintain what Christ has accomplished, what is the will of God uh, for, for us today. And if we do not have these qualities, this unity will not be maintained. This unity will not take place. So I beseech you to walk with all lowliness and meekness with long suffering. Okay, what is lowliness and gentleness or meekness? It's a humility of mind. Think of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 is the greatest example of that. He is God. He's got all the glory and the honor and the holiness and everything. He chose to humble himself, to make himself, to come into a lower state because he loves you and he loves me. He became lower, lower than man. He became a criminal, not that he commit crime, but he took the role, the penalty, the function of a human being, lower than the angels, lower than the human being, lower, lower unto death, obedience unto death. So that's what we talk here. All of these qualities that you see in verse 2 are qualities that you see at the cross. You see these qualities first in the Lord that we love, in the Lord that is our model. So later on we will be exhorted to grow into the mature, to the likeness, to the full measure of Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about this morning. We have to grow. And these, you know, these words here are the areas of our life in which we all fail. These are the areas of our weaknesses. Do you agree with me? Yes. This is where all the trouble comes in relationship. Working relationship, family relationship, and the church. These are the missing qualities or the weakness. When we are weak in these qualities, nothing's working. We don't love one another. We don't forgive one another. We have something against. We see the failings. We see the weaknesses. We, we criticize. We don't agree. We, 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 something's wrong. You hurt me. I will hurt you. I don't forgive you. That's why these qualities are so important. I beseech you, Paul says, as the one leading you by the authority of the Lord, I beseech you to walk like that. Yes? yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Stephen. I know you practice that. Not only because you said amen, but because I know your, your, your way of life. Lowliness and meekness. You know the word meekness before Jesus Christ was a terminology of weakness. Meekness means, Psh, I don't want that. We need to rule. The, the strong eats the weak. That, isn't that what? We're not going to let anybody step o over us. It's like a, a term of losers. We could say losers instead of that. That's before Christ. You know, Moses was a meek man, the meekest man that ever existed. It says it in the scriptures. He was the meekest man that ever existed. Was he a weak man? He was a leader of millions of people. He was a strong man. But when they came to attack him, when they, they wanted to uh, promote themselves, why are you the only leaders here? And the priest came to him. He threw himself right on the ground before God and he did not want to seek his revenge or anything he let God do it but God defended him see our unity is a spiritual unity it, we need to understand that here Jesus Christ he says that he was meek and lowly in heart that's how the Bible described Jesus Christ the Messiah so before Christ Meek, weak, meekness or lowliness meant weakness or losers. Hallelujah. But we see this quality in Philippians chapter 2. That is the main quality that brought salvation to you and to me. Without that quality in Christ, we would not be here today. So this quality is the imitation of Christ. That's so important. That's where we fail. That's where all the trouble in churches happen. That's, that's the reason we have divisions in churches all over the world. That's why Christianity is div divided all over the world. Because we don't have that. And next, next, 
long suffering with long sufferings forbearing one with one another and this one pay attention because long suffering coma forbearing with one another it's it's a connected expression it's not two different qualities one quality is applied by the other uh, definitions forbearing with one another long suffering coma forbearing this is a with long suffering forbearing with one another what is uh, long suffering long suffering we could translate it maybe we will understand it better long tempered long before losing our temper anybody has lost your temper lately long tempered long before losing your temper and this is only by the love poor in our heart by the holy spirit long suffering so it's long before you lose your temper forbearing with one another this is the application what is forbearance forbearing it's patient self control it's the uh, spiritual ability to refrain from asking or enforcing something that is due to you for example someone has a debt to you you can force him to pay or you can be patient and refrain from being mean or forcing that person if that person has difficulties or or, or you refrain from asking for your right or you refrain from asking for an obligation that is due to you so it's that that quality a refraining from enforcing something that you are entitled to it's your right you can do it that person is wrong you are right you can ask something in return but you will not do it because there's a higher reason because of Christ because if you do maybe that person will leave the church maybe that your reputation will will uh, not be good and not re good uh, representative of Christ because of a higher reason because of your unity in Christ you are not doing that because you are more noble you have the qualities of Christ in you and we need this essential quality you know in the body of Christ there will always be wrongs and hurts between people in God's family I, I repeat it and you know it there will always be wrongs and hurts in the family of God. Always. Disappointment, criticism, someone talking against, uh, a betrayal of some sort. There will always be these things. Why? Because of you. <laughs> because of your imperfections. Because of my imperfections. Because of our sinful nature. Because of our pride. Because of everything that we, we are from the, the old flesh that we still have you know I, I always give this definition about Christian marriage and I will use it as an example Christian marriage is the commitment of two imperfect person to the person of Jesus Christ and to each other okay so why do we have problems and marriage because the definition says it is the commitment of two imperfect person because of the imperfect person, <coughs> they become <coughs> united, <coughs> then you will have problems. But where's the hope of marriage? Ah, the commitment is to the person of Jesus Christ. So as you live near Jesus, as you let Jesus Christ come near to you, then you will have uh, the ability to change, to grow, to forgive, to be patient, to be kind. So it's the same thing here. There will always be wrong and hurts in the body of Christ. You've been hurt. Have you ever been hurt? Yes. yes. Okay, but good. The good thing is that you're still here. Eh? Okay, that's, you're still here. Hallelujah for that. Long sufferings and forbearing with one another. It means forbearing toward the mistakes of others. We know the mistakes. We see the mistakes. Have you ever noticed in the church that it is every Christian knows the problems in the church? Every Christian can uh, point the, the, the pastor's fault, uh, the, the structure's fault, the board, the activities, the decision, anything that is, is wrong or could be perceived as wrong, this is, this is the easiest thing to see. We know that. We see that. Then the problem is when we go and talk about it and put people down and criticize and, and continues. So here forbearing is toward the mistake of others 
Long suffering and forbearing with one another will prevent, listen to that, will prevent a break of the unity that Christ achieved on the cross. This is only love bearing, uh, 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 long suffering and forbearing with one another that will prevent that. If we don't have that, the, the problems will become too important not to avoid and it will break the unity of the body of Christ. So that's really, really important. And all, again, I, I want to repeat that all these qualities are seen at the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Verse 3. And endeavoring to keep the unity it's okay. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Verse three makes it clear why these loving and forgiving qualities are necessary. What's the goal? To maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Okay? The unity, let's talk about the unity of the body of Christ. The unity of the body of Christ is not a structural unity. It's not a, a denominational unity. It's not a membership. It's not determined by membership or enrollment. It's not like that. It's not that kind of unity. It's not because we belong to... So many times people ask us, are you uh, this? Are you Methodist? Are you Assemblies of God? Are you this? Are you that? And we say, no, we are... Lighthouse, you know, Lighthouse was established here in Hong Kong. We come from different backgrounds and we, we try to stay focused on the Word of God and, you know. But it's very hard for people to uh, accept this idea that we are not part of a, of a denomination or something. And some people will only respect you if you are part of a denomination of something. But Jesus talks about something that is much better than that. It's a unity of the spirit. So this is not a unity made by man's rules, statutes, and all this. You know, in the assemblies that I was before in Canada, we, uh, we have now a book that is called um, uh, Rights, Duties, and Statutes of uh, Rules and Regulations, in other words. And this is the story of, of every church that grow into a fellowship and denomination. You have to establish a lot of rules and, and if you want to maintain orders and, and unity among many churches that is growing and spreading. That's the history of the church that I'm telling you in a short time. But here Jesus is talking about b before you start writing all your rules and your regulations to prevent problems, start by checking you out. Because I always tell people, it is not the church the government that is really important. You can be from different church affiliation and government. That's not the most important. It's who is in the church government. If you have the flesh in that church government, it doesn't matter which church government you have. If that church government is not led by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will have the flesh. You will have fighting, you will have dispute, you will have people angry with one another, you will have people who want to win their arguments and cannot lose their arguments, and then, you will have, and then you will have church split. So it's not the church government, you can be Episcopalian with, with a, a bishop going down, or you can be Presbyterian with multiple leaders, or you can have a pastor like in the Congregationalist uh, church uh, background, it doesn't matter. Is do you maintain the unity of the spirit? If you do maintain the unity of the spirit, whatever government you have, the church will prosper. But put the flesh there, it doesn't matter which church government you will have, it will be uh, broken. This unity is made by Jesus on the cross, and it brought Jews and Gentiles together. This unity removes human barriers. Different races, nationalities, language, economic classes. It removes that because it brings us to something much, much, much better. Let us live near to Christ. That's where we need to live. You know why? Because division in churches never begin with those who are full of love for the Savior. Think about that. Someone who is full of love for the Lord Jesus, you will not hear about divisions in there. Never. So live near to Jesus. There's no divisions. Live away from Jesus. You will see signs. This is Spurgeon who said that. 
division in churches never begin with those full of love to the Savior. And remember that because of our sinful nature, unity does not just happen. It says you must endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. So that brings us to the next point. What does endeavor mean? Endeavor is a very interesting word. You know, I'm not an English speaker, I'm a French speaker, so I need to take my dictionary sometime to, to find out what words mean. I'm just like you. So, it means speed, eagerness, diligence, and haste. That's what it means. Now read that sentence again and put this terminology there. Use speed to be quick, to be diligent, to strive, and do your best. But do it. You think about that. You're diligent. You do your best. You, you, you want to maintain that. You want to protect that. Because this is what Christ wants for us. This is what Christ achieved for us. So, so as members, as mature members of a church, when you see that this is being endangered by attitudes, by the way some people talk, or by different people in the church, you should endeavor to maintain that unity, because that unity, because of our sinfulness, is fra fragile. It's fragile. You understand that? So, so because it's fragile, because of our uh, sinful nature, we need to endeavor, be quick. You, you see something wrong by the, to, to keep the bond of peace. You know, if there is no bond of peace, there's a reason. If there's a war on the outside, it's because there's a war in the inside. Remember that? Remember that. If there's a war in the body of Christ outside, it's because there's a war inside in the heart. Something is not in the bond of peace. Something is not with, with Christ. When the peace of God rules our hearts, then we build unity. If the, rule, uh, the, the, the peace of God rules, we must endeavor to keep this unity. You know, difference among people will can lead to divisions. Difference in uh, opinions, difference in personalities, and preferences, name it, whatever it is. But this should not be true in the church. We should be quick endeavor to mend, to repair, to, to be a peacemaker, to, to, to fix the conflicts and the difference. Amen? Next point, next, next slide. Uh, no, I mean uh, this, this one here, the, this lower part here, verse 4 to 6. The foundation of the unity of the church. And to maintain unity, we should remember what unites us. So what unites us? Here we have a list. One body, one spirit, one future, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We have all of these things and it brings us into, into God. We have unity because of what we share in common in Jesus Christ. This is greater than our differences. This is what we need to focus. And some people may say, oh, but uh, you know, me, I'm not really interested in doctrines, but just in love. It doesn't work. Our unity is based on the word of God. Our unity must be centered on Christ. Our unity is based on the doctrines of the faith. It's not just uh, happening because people have nice feelings. Oh, I like the songs. Uh, you know, it's cool. Or this, you know, it has to be maintained and, and Christ on these things. Let's look to the next verse 7 and 8. God works unity in the church through spiritual gifts that he gives to each one of us and through gifts of leadership that he gives to the church. Verse 7 and 8. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captive, captivity captives and he gave gifts to man. This is a kind of, these verses are always difficult to read and, and understand, so we need to simplify it a little bit. But to each one of us, grace. The word grace is the word carries. It's a word carries. It's a spiritual giving uh, of God. So to each one of us, so it's not only a, a gift, because sometimes the English words of gift takes away some of the meaning. If you put the word carries there, you, you see something divine, something spiritual, a spiritual gift. is given to how many of us? Each one of us. Each one of us. Do you have one? Yes. 
Do you have charis? Yes. What is charis then? Charis is a God-given ability for growth, for Christ-likeness, and for service. And this charis will, will, if you live with this charis and apply it in your life and grow in this, Christ will be glorified. All of these gifts here, you see that we read each one grace was given. Charis is given, number one. Number two, he went to heaven. He took captivity captives and he gave gifts to men. So gifts are for the church unity, for edification, for the common good. And Paul taught here that Christ is the giver of these gifts. What th this complicated uh, text that is a quote from the psalm. And uh, it means that when he ascended on high, it refers to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died. He rose from the dead. And it's like a picture of a military conquest. The sinner who were once held captive by sin and Satan are now being taken captive by Christ. And his, and his death and in his resurrections, he set the captives free. He takes those who were captives and he takes captivity captives to himself. And he becomes the, 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 the triumphant conqueror of all of this. And now that it all belongs to him and he fulfills everything in him, then he gives gifts so that this body of Christ will be built into his likeness. Amen? Hallelujah. Then if we continue, a uh, verse that we are quite familiar with, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. And then again you see the, the, the sentence, He himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, or pastors slash teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He himself, and pay attention to that because it is Christ who gave and established these offices. It's not man-made ideas or concepts. Pastors, it's not man-made. Prophets, evangelists, uh, apostles, or missionaries. It's Christ who gave these gifts for a reason. These are a divine uh, institution and not human invention. So we need to, to remember that because in our generation, th think about it, look at all the news that you see in the, in the, the world, whatever you see. What, many, many uh, preaching styles today is so relaxed, it's so cool. Uh, uh, the books that are being written. In our generation, every office of authority is shunned. It's like a despise, a little bit put down. It's not really, really good. It's like authority is perceived negatively. In the eyes of God, God is always the authority. Christ is always the authority. Christ has given a, a plan, an idea, a blueprint in the plan of action, he has given gifts, he has given structures, he has given spiritual gifts. These are spiritual gifts. He has given it to the church to fulfill his plan. So we need to remember these things and review over that because what is our attitude toward the spiritual gifts of leadership in the church? Some people are uh, quick to, to criticize, quick to put down, quick to, to you know, to uh, shun these, any sorts of authority. So, so here it's good to, to be remembered. Here we have pastors slash teachers. Someone who shepherd the flock of God primarily through the teaching of the word of God. So the purpose of these gifts are very clear mentioned over here. He gave some for, look at verse 12 here for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building of the body of Christ. And I want to talk about the word perfecting because it's a very important word. And many of our modern Bible versions says the equipping. And I, I personally, I don't like the, the word equipping in a, in a way because I've been using it, but I've been uh, rethinking about it uh, more recently. Equipping, we use it a lot in the leadership training. This is a modern trend today. Uh, you, you bring leaders. In the Bible, we train, we equip, uh, we, let me, let me rephrase, we, f we develop disciple. Discipleship is better than leadership. 
because leadership assumes that it puts you into a, it cultivates your human pride. You are the leader of this. You are the leader of that. As soon as you have the term leader, it's this kind of human being we tend to, uh, you know, uh, put it too high. Discipleship brings an idea of, of humility, of service. You will be the greatest when you will be the servant of all. That's not what leadership is all about today in and, and, and modern terms. So here we have a word here that is perfecting. And that's the correct word. You know, sometimes we like modern teaching, equipping. It's also part of it. But I think perfecting is better than uh, equipping, and I will explain to you why. Go to the next slide. What is perfecting means? Perfecting is the idea to put right. That's what it is. Put right what was wrong. So it's not only equipping. Equipping is like, okay, I'm giving you some instruction. Do this. One, two, three. Boom. And then, oh, do this function. It's more about task-oriented equipping for, for work, for task. But I prefer this one because it deals with your old person. It deals with your, uh, you, with your mind. It deals with your heart first. Before it gives you instructions, go and do this, go and do that. Or obey me or uh, submit yourself to me or something. Be before we go there, start by the beginning. Fix what is wrong in your life. And that is what the pastor teacher is doing first. Put right. And then you see the other terminology. Repair, mend and restore. Adjust, prepare, and make perfectly joined together. That's all this. So these are also used for setting broken bones and mending nets. They, these are the, the, the illustration used in the Bible using the exact same verb, verbs. So you're fixing the net. It's been broken. The fish will not stay in the net. We need to repair that to make it so that we can gather the, the, the fish and stuff. We need to mend, we need to, you, you break a bone, somebody set, set it back in, in its place. One time I, I, I hit a, a mosquito on the floor and my, my, I was in uh, Cheng Chao Island, I had uh, two days of, of vacation with Bridget and then my finger became like this, just like that, and then like this. And it was very painful. But I didn't want to go to the hospital. So I just took it and I just put it back. <laughs> it was very painful, but I didn't have to go to the hospital. I, I, I did exactly that. I perfected my finger. I made it right. I put it right where it was. Okay. So that's what pastors are supposed to do. To perfect, make right what was wrong. To prepare strong and mended and fit Christians. So before we give you a task to do, it's not about equipping, it's about perfecting the body of Christ, the members of the body of Christ to become usable by the Lord. We start by the beginning, adjusted and fit. And then for the work of ministry, the, the ministry here is diaconia. Diaconia is service. It's ministry. Jesus Christ uh, is diaconia. The deacons are diaconia. Serving at the table is diaconia. These are the same, the same terminology. It's serving at the table. Serving is just a general term. So for the ministry of serving. So the church has this uh, in the background. We come here to be perfected so that we would be prepared, mended, fit, and ready or uh, usable. To will be usable. We will be actively in, in service because that's how we, we serve one another. Ready to work at serving. That's what it means. You will be perfected so that you will be ready to work at serving so that the body of Christ will be built up. And the word built up here is also very uh, interesting because it's kind of a, a terms of ac architect. Like if Brother Alistair would be here, uh, he is an architect. It's oiko domai. Oiko means a house, a family, or a dwelling. And domai is like to build up to the roof. It's to, you, you make a structures and you build it to the roof. So like an architect 
is perfecting, adjusting, and perhaps repairing the blueprint that what will be built from the foundation to the roof will be solidly built, it will not collapse. So that's what the role of the pastors, teachers are here. So this is our first responsibility, to do just that, to perfect and prepare people to serve. And this, I think, Pastor Jennifer and I, we understand our role very, very clearly. Amen? Hallelujah. We want to do that. This is what we believe we'll be doing. We have continued to do it from uh, when Pastor Steve and Pastor Mary established Lighthouse. And if you are in Lighthouse, you should recognize that for the last 20 years, we walk in the same uh, direction. Hallelujah. So at Lighthouse here, the pastors understand that role to feed with the word, to protect the flock, and to mend Man, what needs to be mended. Another role of the pastors, I want to come back to the word that we read at first verse, is beseech. The word to beseech. What does beseech mean? Beseech means to admonish, to appeal, but you, you implore, you, you beg, you urge, you insist, you uh, exhort, you entreat. It's not only, oh, oh hi, would you like to? It, it's, it's a very strong like appeal to you. Don't quit. Come, do it. D don't stop. Like, go on. It's like a very, very strong, like you implore the person, you beg the person. And Paul was very strong on beseeching. Strong to cause to Christians to fulfill their duties. Strong to call Christians to walk in a manner worthy. Strong to call uh, Christians to fulfill what God had prepared, the, the good works, to serve each other. And I have a verse to, to read to you, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, here. And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. That's Paul speaking. We pleaded with you. Look at the verb here. Pleaded encourage and urge you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. For he called you to share in his kingdom and glory. So you have three verbs here to describe, again, the, some more of the pastor role. And if you think, it, it's not strange to think in this way. Look at all the parents here in this room. If you are a parent, you do beseech your children every day. From the time they wake up in the morning, you beseech them. You implore them, you beg them, and sometimes very, with very strong, convincing words, because you may get angry also. And you correct them, and you want them to, to grow, because if you care for your children's future and success in life, parents must beseech. It's just the natural way. If you don't, you're not really fulfilling what it should be. Because parents have expectation, you push. You motivate, you encourage, you apply pressure, you correct, you, so that they will grow, they will develop, so they will learn to overcome difficulties. This is called bringing the best in people. You bring the best out of your children by using the means that you have. You bring the best, pastor, bring the, try, or pray, to bring the best out of Christians by beseeching, by going to the scriptures, by exhorting, bringing the, the model, live like that, imitate this, continue to end, end this way. Amen? Amen? And we conclude with the next uh, scriptures. The first evidence of spiritual maturity, verse 13 to 14. Next slide. This will continue until... You see, this ministry of the church continues from generation to generation. We've been here for 20 years. Pastor Steve has been here before. He has been doing that for more than 50, 60 years of ministries. So before him, others were doing that. So it continues until we come to the unity of faith and knowledge of God's Son, mature, measuring up to the full, complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature children, tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Okay, so what kind of evidence of spiritual maturity do we see here? First one is unity of faith. Is that right? You see that? Unity of faith. This is the first goal of, of God's work here, that the pastors 
will try to achieve. Number two is a growth and knowledge and growth in likeness of Jesus Christ, measuring to the fullness of Christ. Are you there yet? Have you reached that level yet? Yes or no? no. Okay, thank you for your honesty. I, I, also, I'm included in that no also. So as the years pass, we should not only grow old in the church, we should grow in Christ and likeness. Number three, what is it in verse 14? Stability, solid, discerning the lies and deceit. You know and you can discern and compare the non-biblical with the biblical. It is clear because you have been uh, perfected by the word of God, by the ministry of the teaching of the pastors through o o many years, your personal studies, your reading of the scriptures. When deceitfulness come, when cunning man comes, when new doctrines comes, you reject. Don't accept everything that is done in the name of a preacher or in a Christian book. Discern. Disagree with certain things. It's okay. You need to. And also don't confuse movement with growth. Activity, super activity, churches that do everything, lots of programs, lots of programs. Movement is not synonymous of of growth. It's not necessarily. It could be an indication, but not necessarily. Don't confuse that. Next verse, verse 15 and 16, and we finish with this. We will speak the truth and love. So here is a balance of truth and love. This is another sign of maturity in the church. Verse 15 and 16, you will see that the body of Christ, the members, participates in and cooperate with. You have these, these two words here. He makes the whole body, and remember that it is Christ-centered. He is the head. He makes the whole body fit together. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. So look at the next slide. Just a, a summary of evidence of spiritual maturity to close and look at ourselves. And I will invite Pastor, uh, Sister Penina to come, and we will just take communion in a moment. Evidence of spiritual maturity, unity of faith, growth in, no in the knowledge and the likeness of Christ, stability, a balance of truth and love, and a participation and cooperation. And the last verse, 